Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. The message that continues to be entitled, Work Your Level. How many of you have ever prayed before? Yeah, pretty much everybody. At one point or the other, everyone has. Um, in, in this country, we even have a national day of prayer. People around the world who pray for all kinds of things. Every time there's a disaster of any kind, people always say that they're praying. Uh, you know, we just had this, this suicide bomber in Manchester, and everybody's talking about praying. But I can't help but ask this. Is who are they praying to? I kind of wonder about that. Uh, and, and, and what for, yeah, uh, and, and what, do, what do people think is going to happen because they're praying? And really, if you're, if you're a Christian this morning, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God and, and you've joined us here this morning as a Christian, you've got to ask yourself, who am I praying to? What do I think prayer is? Because I, I think sometimes we look at prayer as kind of a last-ditch effort to get what we want. Uh, tried everything else, and so I might as well pray. Something I do when nothing else works. I can't think of anything else to do, so I might as well pray. Is, is that what it is? Is it a means of getting what I want? And one thing is certain, in the series that we're doing right now, if you want to level up in your relationship with Jesus, then prayer is going to be a vital, crucial part of that. Luke chapter 18, in verse 1, Then he, this being Jesus, spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Lord, now as we pray, not maybe fully aware of exactly all the prayer is, or could be, or should be. And we just ask you, Lord, if you would move in our hearts and in our minds to help us understand to a greater degree what prayer is, what you intend prayer to be, that we might do it, practice it, and have prayer be a fundamental element in our Christian lives, and something that helps us grow every day. So we pray that you'd illuminate our understanding today about prayer as we pray. We trust that you will because we ask it from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Easton's Bible Dictionary defines prayer as conversation with God, the communion of the soul with God, not in contemplation or meditation, but in direct address to Him. Prayer may be oral or mental, occasional or constant, spontaneous or formal. That's Easton's Bible Dictionary definition of prayer. And I think, and this is just me, so you don't have to agree with me, but I think sometimes we can make too much of prayer, or we can make too little of prayer. It's a rare occasion when we have a good balanced approach to it. We think it's a way to get what we want, or we think it's a hopeless waste of time. And you have thought that before about prayer. Don't tell me that you haven't. Why pray? Nothing ever happens when I pray. See, you have thought that before. Yeah, we do it because we think we ought to. Although sometimes we don't put a whole lot of hope in it. In this current series, this series is an epilogue to our studies through the book of 1 Peter. So after going all the way through first, the book of 1 Peter, that series we call it Level Up. That in our Christian life, you can't stay right where you are. You've got to keep leveling up in your Christian life. Now we're kind of following that up with an epilogue to that series. And the idea here is, is whatever level you're on, you've got to work that level. Because if you want to level up, you've got to work the level that you're on right now. And so we're going through different things. We've talked about service, and we've talked about giving, and we talked. what else have we talked about in this series? A bunch of stuff. We've talked about memory. Memory. Stuff. I, th I thought we I couldn't. Did we talk about that? 
<laughs> so we talked about I don't remember that. So we talked about, about a lot of stuff in this in this current series of working the level that you're on. And so today you're going to work your prayers. Point number one, and again the only point that I have, and uh, it's up on the jumbotrons and it's in the handout that you have in your hand. Luke chapter 18 verse one. We have to pray at all times, or we ought to, or men ought always to pray, and not lose heart. Now. To me, the thing that stands out about that little passage is the not lose heart part. That's what got my attention. And it's interesting because that phrase, that use of those words, not lose heart, don't lose heart, from Greek, if you work it from the Greek into the English, it means don't turn out to be a coward. Kind of like that. Don't lose your courage. Like that. In the New Testament, losing heart generally means to be faint-hearted, to faint, or to despond in view of a trial or difficulty. And I got thinking about that, and I thought the funny thing is, is we generally don't start praying until we're faint-hearted and in despair. And I thought, that doesn't seem like that's right. It seems like prayer ought to be the thing we ought to do first. Now the word prayer, in all of its variables, pray, prayer, praying, prayed, all of those different variables, it's found in Scripture hundreds and hundreds of times. So prayer seems to be a regular part of everything that's happening in the Bible. And more importantly, you see dozens and dozens of times Bible characters praying. And perhaps nobody's prayer life was more obvious than Jesus himself. As a matter of fact, it was his prayer life, and we have in the four different Gospel accounts, at least 24 different specific occasions where Jesus is mentioned uh, as praying, specifically. And in fact, it was his prayer life that was seen by the disciples that prompted them to ask him, Lord, teach us to pray, in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. And Jesus responded with what we call the Lord's Prayer. It really isn't his prayer. It's kind of at least the way that I've always taught it is, it's a model for prayer. Uh, it is something that you can pray if you want, and everybody kind of has memorized it. It's still lurking in your thoughts somewhere. But, it, but it's not necessarily the prayer that you have to pray. Let's look at it like this, and this would be letter A in, in your outline. And that is, who do I pray to? So turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. And in verses 5 to 15, Jesus says this, When you pray, when you pray, it doesn't say if you pray, it says, When you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, not if you pray, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, not if you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. I know a lot of people that probably ought to study that little verse right there. <laughs> verse 8, Therefore do not be like them. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Interesting. So who do I pray to? Well, I, I pray to God. This is intended to be not the prayer, but a prayer, as I said, kind of a model for prayer. And we might break it down like this. First of all, we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Jesus' introduction to instruction on prayer begins with two things. It begins with worship and relationship. Worship and relationship. That's where the prayer starts. It's a relationship because He's our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father. It's worship because He is holy, hallowed, 
Hallowed be your name. He is the creator of the universe. The focus, uh, this introduction, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It first of all focuses us on the character of God, who we're praying to. And sometimes I think we forget that. Those, both of those acknowledgments are important. But we always have to remember that it's the privilege of the children to ask things of their father. And I like uh, what um, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said one time about prayer. He said, you come before a great king, ask of him great things. Is there anything that he can't do? So why would you not ask him for anything? And you can ask him for anything you want, and we'll get to that as we go along. <laughs> and you've heard me say this many, many times here. There's a difference between being a child of the king and being a subject of the king. Everybody in the world, everybody on the planet is a subject in God's kingdom, but not everybody in the world is a child of the king. The child of the king gets to climb up on the father's lap, even though he's the king. The subjects don't get to do that. The subject tries to do that, it's off with your head. But for the child of the king, you climb up on his lap, he's still the king. It doesn't make him any less a king. So we need to remember who we're coming to. It's a relationship, but it's a relationship with God, the creator of the universe. Then it's your kingdom come, your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. This is both acknowledgement and acquiescence. Acquiescence. Remember, I use big words here so you think I'm smart. That's why I use that word. Acknowledgement and acquiescence. We acknowledge that God not only has a will, right? Your kingdom come, your will be done. He not only has a will, but he has a plan and the power to implement that will. He has done so in heaven, and we're asking him to do, on earth here, exactly what he does in heaven. Order things perfectly. That's what we're asking him to do. In other words, when we submit our prayers to him, when we pray to him, what we're saying is, whatever it is that I'm asking you for, Lord, if I'm asking anything that is contrary to your will, don't do it. That's what we're saying. Lord, here's all my stuff, and if you don't want to do any of it, don't. Because I want your will above and beyond my own will. Have you ever included that in your prayers? Have you ever thought that as you're praying your prayers? Lord, here's what's on my heart, but if you don't want to do any of it, don't. Because I'd rather have your will than my own. His will be done, not mine. You really need to think about what that means when we pray that. Further, we're asking him, give us this day our daily bread, there in verse 11. This is asking God to meet our daily needs, not necessarily what's beyond today. Right? I, I'm a big fan of having many, many years worth of needs met right now. <laughs> so I have them in reserve whenever I want to access them. Lord, give us today our needs for the next decade at least. Because we want to be prepared. It's like, do you, do you have any idea who you're talking to here? Who could provide whatever it is that you need at any moment of any day, in any way, shape, or form, in ways that you and I have not ever considered. This is asking God to meet our daily needs. And because of what we see in ourselves, we ask Him, forgive us our debts. Because this sees sin as a debt. When we sin against God, there's a price to pay for it. That's what happens. Well, we praise God here in this church because we believe that Jesus came, God incarnate, died on a cross to pay the price that we rightly owe God for our violations of His laws. That's what Jesus did for us. Now, through faith and trust in Jesus for who He is and what He has done for us, God wipes our debt clear. Now we're asking him, forgive us our debts, but look at how we're asking him to do it. As we forgive our debtors. So we're asking him, forgive me, listen, forgive me in the same way that I forgive others. <laughs> All that means, I think, is I don't have as much forgiveness as I think that I need or would like to have. 
because I'm not entirely sure. I know how I want him to forgive me. I want him to wipe my slate clean. I want him to forget about all the things that I've done against him, to him, by violating his law, and now he's asking me to do the same thing to others. Okay, I remember, I know, I'm conscious in my mind of what other people have done to me, and he's asking me to release them from that debt. You understand that? Release them from that debt. It doesn't mean that they didn't do it. It doesn't mean you weren't harmed in the process. It means I'm asking him, release my debt in the way that I release their debt. Didn't you notice there in verse 14 and 15, if you forgive men their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. You want to be forgiven, you need to be a forgiving person. We're asking God to forgive us for our violations of His laws. So He says, okay, now turn that same forgiveness, the forgiveness that I give you, turn that outward to others. Wow. Let's just leave that right there. But we also need a lot of help because the prayer closes out with do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know what that is? It's a plea for divine protection and deliverance. We're confessing to God in prayer that we are easily led astray and that we make easy victims of Satan. That's what we're saying. And as you know, you guys have heard me say this here many times as well. And we're not even easy victims of Satan. We're easy victims of our own stupidity. Right? So I don't think Satan's half as busy as we think he is. I get in plenty of trouble all on my own. I don't need his help. But we're acknowledging that to God. Lord, I'm, I'm kind of not as good as I think I am. Now, Lord, protect me. Protect me. Keep me safe. And we're acknowledging that God's kingdom is the victorious kingdom. Lord, I'm a part of your kingdom. I want to stay a part of your kingdom. I want to be a part of your kingdom. That's what I want. He has the power to protect and to deliver us as no one else does, as we can't even do for ourselves. And he does that for us. Now, each of these elements in this prayer is important to a balanced prayer life. Not, again, not that you have to pray that exact line, but as a concept, as what each one of those things represents. Again, you don't have to use that prayer, you can pray it if you like. There's nothing wrong with praying that word for word, and, and we do so with great comfort. But it's a model or a guide for praying our own prayers. Okay, so next, letter B. Why should I pray? Why should I pray? Well, the Bible gives us lots of different reasons. Uh, good places you might want to turn to Philippians chapter 4. Go ahead, you can do it. Turn your Bibles or scroll in your device or to no, this is the generation where the pastors can say that. <laughs> Scroll in your device over. And one of these days, because these things go out on YouTube and they're on the internet, a hundred years from now, should the Lord tarry, someone's going to look back and, and listen to this and say, Scroll in your device, what does that mean? I don't even know what that means. Scroll in the book, turning, turning your Bible. They had books back then? Why should I pray? Why should I pray? Well, we've got a, a list of reasons. We're going to land in Philippians 4 here in a second. And James chapter 1, verse 5 says, If you need wisdom, let him ask God. If you need wisdom, ask God. How many of you need wisdom? Okay, three of you. Okay, if you need wisdom, ask God. James chapter 1, verse 5. If you feel like venting, if you feel like venting, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your anxiety on him. Well, how do you do that? Let me pray. Cast all your anxiety on him. Or, or how about when I need peace? Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing. Okay, I've already failed. I can't even get past that. Because I'm anxious for many things. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, which is supplication is a form of prayer. Supplication is specifically prayer for yourself. Right? That's supplication. Prayer for yourself. And, uh, be anxious for anything, but... It, in everything, with by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If I want the peace that passes all understanding guarding my heart and my mind, then I have to be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. Uh, with thanksgiving, let my request be made known to God. 
So I gotta do that if I want the peace. I want the peace. How many of you want the peace? Four of you want the peace. Okay, that's good. We're getting there. But if we come back to our definition of prayer, which was a conversation with God, why should I pray? Well, you should pray because you are in a relationship with God. And a relationship requires communication. That's why you should pray. He knows, or we know, because he says in his word, that he hears us when we pray according to his will. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And I will do, or in John chapter 14, verse 13, Jesus says, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Now that places another condition on answered prayer, too. God's going to answer prayers to glorify Jesus. That make Jesus shine. That's what that means. You should pray because He wants you to. He asks you over and over again, ask me, ask me, ask me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, Matthew chapter 7, 7 to 10, Matthew chapter 18, verse 19, the name of you. Jesus wants to hear from you. What, what is this? How do you do this? Well, you've got to talk to Him. You have to talk to Him. And like Jesus said back in Matthew chapter 6, just go in your room, shut your door, and talk to Him. Sometimes it helps to do it out loud. If you pray out loud, not everybody does. Sometimes that helps. Okay, well that brings up that question. Letter C under point number one. How do I pray? How do I pray? Remember what we've read back there in Matthew chapter 6 a number of times. Jesus said, and when you pray. See, he assumes that you are praying. He assumes that you will pray. Why? Well, because you're in a relationship. Now, if, if you're a relatively new believer or new to walking with Christ, the easy question about prayer is, is where do I begin? You know, what is, what is, do I just you know sit here talking to myself? I mean, is that is that what prayer is? How, where do I even begin? It can be a chore to get started or developing a habit of prayer in your life. The other is that if you have been a Christian for a while, you can kind of fall into a formal style of prayer, a rut kind of of sorts, where you just shoot up mindless requests to God without really acknowledging Him. That's a problem because at its core, prayer is relational. It's relational. What I mean is, it's an encounter between two individuals, one speaking and the other listening, and then vice versa. And we often treat prayer as that thing where we just, we just launch it up and then we just go on our way. There's no real acknowledgement of who this is. Remember how the prayer started back in, in Matthew chapter 6, Our Father in Heaven, hallowed be your name. That's acknowledgement. You've got to recognize who you're talking to here and that it is your Heavenly Father and that you are in relationship to Him if you've been born again by His Spirit. Because if you have not been born again by His Spirit, then you're still a subject in the kingdom and you don't have that kind of access. Does He hear you? Sure, He can hear you. But He also knows your heart. And He knows when your heart is right with Him and when it isn't. And if you're crying out to Him for salvation, oh, He'll definitely hear you. No question. For, for us that are His children, can't help but think oftentimes, when we crawl up on his lap and we acknowledge who he is and we say, Father, give me all of these things, and he says, no. <laughs> but I want this, 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 no. But I want to I wanna do this with my life. Mm, no. I want to be in a relationship with this person. Uh, no. I want to go here, I want to do this. Let me think about it for a minute. No. God just says no sometimes. But aren't we praying, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Isn't that what we're praying? Boy, that's, that, now that gets difficult, isn't it? Because i got all kinds of things that I want to do. I have a wonderful plan for my life. If God would just get on board with it and rubber stamp it for me. Then I can get on doing my will for my life that he blesses. And, and really, I'm, I'm making a stupid joke, but you guys get it because we do it. 
this is what I'm going to do, now bless me. God says, mm, yeah. mm. Jesus, Holy Spirit, no, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. We talk, we're not going to do that. We have, a, we have something else. And I can tell you, in my limited experience, that God seems to regularly freak me out. Because he does things for me, with me, to me, through me, that I never ever thought of. Ever. And why would why would he even do that? And it, I don't even know. But he but he does. So let's not treat prayer as just dropping off a note of request to God and then dash off to our next appointment. Yet God is the one who opened the door, we were talking about that on Thursday night, the kind of access that he's given us to himself through Jesus. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, he opens up the access that we now have directly to God the Father. I don't pray to, I don't have to pray to anybody except to God himself. I don't, I don't have to ask a saint to do it. They can't do anything for me. What can a saint do for me? Why would I pray to a saint when I can pray to God Almighty, the creator of the universe? Well, because, because the saint could go ask God for you. But I'm asking God directly. So I don't, I don't need anybody to go ask God directly because I have direct access to God through Jesus because of who he is and what he's, what he's done for me. But, but a saint can help me. What can a saint do that God <coughs> I'd rather have God's help than a saint's help. I mean, I, I, I don't want to just stand here and mock that whole concept, but it just seems inconceivable to me that you'd want to pray to anybody other than God himself. So how do I pray? Prayer is best learned by praying. That's how it's best learned. It's best learned by praying. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, we're told and encouraged, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Make it a habit of your life. Make it something you do. I can tell you, uh, this is just me personally, um, is my prayer life oftentimes is just a running stream of consciousness with God. You know, it's not, I, I don't always have a whole lot of formality in my prayers, as you can probably tell by hanging out with me. But it's, I, I recognize that I have this open access to God at all times, and so I can... I can chat with him anytime that I want, anytime. And I know that even when I'm not directly addressing him, that he sees and knows what's going on inside my head. It's just a little disarming at the same time, but he loves me nevertheless. Thank you for that. So it's good practice just to pray without ceasing. That's how we begin. But I wanted to close with this, and this is important, and I'm going to still be in Philippians chapter 4. And that is the net results of prayer. The net results of prayer. In other words, who benefits from my prayers? Who benefits from my prayers? Well, first and foremost, you do. You benefit from your own prayers. Back again to Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. After I pray, when I pray, in this, I don't want to necessarily call it a prescribed manner, but with this attitude of prayer, what is the net result? The net result is the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We're asking him to do that for other people, but the first beneficiary of the prayer is you. Because you're the one that's stopping, at least in one form of prayer, you're stopping, you're acknowledging who God is, you're addressing him directly. Well, how can you not benefit from stopping and acknowledging who God is and addressing Him directly? Lord, I am in direct one-to-one -one relationship with you, and I'm speaking to you now, and I'm offering up to you things that are concerns on my heart, either for myself or for other people or situations or whatever. Lord, I'm acknowledging you, and I'm directing this conversation to you, not just at you, to you, right? You understand that. 
that distinction, not just at him. I'll just throw these words up at him. So who benefits from my prayers? Well, me. Because I've taken that time to acknowledge him and spend time with him. How can you not benefit from that? We don't do that often enough, do we? He's the, the king of the universe, the creator of all things seen and unseen, our great and awesome God and Savior. And we're asking him, Lord, take everything that I'm bringing in here to you and sort it all out for me. Here's what's on my heart, Lord. And I don't know where all this is going. And I'm asking you to help, help me sort it out. You sort it out for me and then let me know what I should do. You tell me what I should do. And that brings up kind of a, a good point. Again, I, I'm, I'm the first beneficiary of my own prayers. But here's something that Warren Wiersbe said in one of his commentaries about prayer. He says, prayer prepares us for the proper use of the answer. I love that. Prayer per... <laughs> prayer prepares us for the proper use of the ad and loosen things up there. I can't say this too many more times. Prayer prepares us for the proper use of the answer. If you've been by stuff, my wife is laughing at me. Yeah. Say that again. Sure, remember that was Saturday night. Chevy Chase. You always used to do that. Chevy Chase. Oh boy. Yeah, everybody was too young to remember that. If you've been born again by God's Spirit, comes back to our, my very first point, if you have not been born again by God's Spirit, you may be praying to God, but you've got a division between you. The division is sin, and needs to be taken away. Only Jesus can do that. When you surrender your life to Him, acknowledge who He is and what He's done for you, and when you acknowledge that, then He removes that enmity, that's the word, enmity, and reconciles you back to God. Now you have this access to Him. And that relationship needs communication for it to grow. No relationship works without <laughs> communication. So when Wiersbe says that the prayer, the praying, prepares you to receive the answer, think back to our model prayer in Matthew chapter 6. As we acquiesce, as we acknowledge, as we give all things up to God, seek His forgiveness and reconciliation, we're saying, Lord, here's everything that I'm thinking. Now you tell me what I ought to do. You help me to sort it out. Our relationship to God, being born again by the Spirit of God, we enter into a direct one-to-one -one relationship with God our Savior, and no relationship works without communication. What happens when you don't talk to your spouse? Yeah, <laughs> all heck breaks loose. <laughs> Why are you giving me the silent treatment? <laughs> what have I done? Now what happens if you only talk at your spouse, but never listen? That gets even worse. <laughs> I've never done that personally. You know, I've heard of others that did. So. Like, honey, do this for me. And she's like, and what reason should I do that? What do you repeat? But don't we treat God that way? Lord, do this for me. And then we just walk away. Because communication requires us to occasionally sit quietly and keep your mouth shut. Keep your ears open. In John chapter 10, Jesus gives us a clue here. And this is kind of important because sometimes we tend to treat hearing God's voice as some sort of wildly supernatural weirdness. And God's word doesn't really treat it that way. Jesus here in John chapter 10, verses 1 to 5, he says, Most assuredly I say to you, 
he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up by some other way is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. Here we go. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. That's you. You're the sheep. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. Remember that? We follow him. We follow him. We don't lead him. We follow him. He leads them out. He goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Why? They know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Okay, the first place you're going to hear the voice of God. You want to hear the voice of God every single day. The first place you're going to hear it is every time you open up his word. This is the voice of God speaking to you. Every time you open up God's word, he's speaking to you. And again, you know, we don't have to treat hearing God's voice as something's going to like... People say, you know, do you hear voices? I'm like, yeah, lots of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. <laughs> but if we expect to become adept at hearing his voice, we need to learn how to be quiet before him. Take time in your prayers to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. What's God going to say to you? I don't know. I know one thing is God will never contradict His Word. He'll never tell you to do anything that He hasn't made clear in His Word. So we need to understand that. We'll talk about that when we uh, get into our next series coming up soon. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. But how are you going to hear His voice if you're not ever shut up? So take time in prayer and just not ask for anything. Here's a great thing to do in prayer. We've done this here before. Take some time in prayer sometime and don't ask Him for anything. Try that. Don't ask Him for anything. Just thank Him. Just thank Him. You might be surprised at what happens. First of all, it's very, very difficult not to ask Him for something. Try it and see. Today, try it. Just don't ask Him anything. And the first thing you're going to do is you're going to ask Him for something. Watch. But just thank Him for things. Well, I, I don't know what to be thankful for. Yeah, you do. You'll figure it out. And once you start thanking Him for things, you'd be amazed at the flood of thankfulness that comes out. While in Philippians chapter 4, it says, that's one of the keys to receiving the peace of God. That thanksgiving. Again, what does it say about a relationship if all I ever do is talk, but never listen? Look, I've done on prayer lots of times in this church. And every time I do, I feel like I haven't even gotten close to what it really is. I feel like, you know, here we are, it's the end of the message, everybody say amen. amen. It's the end of the message, and, and, and I, I feel like, okay, well, you know, here I've been talking for, you know, 40 minutes, of, I know it went by, you know, blink of an eye. Uh, we've been talking for 40 minutes about prayer, and I feel like I, I haven't even begun to do justice to the topic. But hopefully, what I've done is plant some seeds in your brain to make you think about it. But we must begin here if we're going to work this level. The level that you are on right now, in your Christian life, is going to be worked with prayer. And that's conversation with God. That's all the things that we've talked about and more. That's beginning the practice. That's learning how to acquiesce to His will. It's learning how to acknowledge who it is that we're addressing. It's also up to you and to me to listen as well. Remember, prayer is a conversation between you and God. You speak, He listens. He speaks, you listen. Every time you open up His Word, keep your ears open. And lastly, it's not the prayer that has the power. There's some people that like to treat prayer as a power. If you just pray the right prayer, then you can get anything that you want. If you just pray it the right way, that's, you know, certain Pentecostal wings of the church. The word faith movement especially. You know, it's prayer, it's power, you know. You just got to pray the right prayer. If you do, then you can do this or get that. That's not it at all. It's not your prayer that has power. It's the one that you pray to. 
He's the one with the power. But you remember, we've already acquiesced to his will. We've already said, not my will be done, but yours. We've already said that. So now what am I trying to get? I'm trying to get whatever he wants. And I want whatever he wants in my life. All of it. Even though it says in James chapter 5, verse 16, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, I'm wondering if we've ever even got to the fervent part in our prayer life. Again, it's not because of the righteous man that prays, but it's because of our righteous, merciful, and gracious God who listens. Let's pray. Gracious God, we do acknowledge who you are. And we do bend our knees, at least in our hearts, to you. For who you are and what you've done for us, we are grateful. Because we couldn't have this access apart from you and what you've done. You made the way. We couldn't make the way. You made the way. And we acknowledge that. Now, Lord, as we just take just all the confusion that's in our minds and our hearts, especially about prayer, and turn it all over to you, we ask you to minister to us. Speak to us about prayer. Encourage us in our prayer life. And importantly, Lord, help us to listen. us to take that time and not be afraid to be quiet before you. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to stay in constant, regular communication with you. We trust that you'll do this because you've asked us to. You even told us to agree together in your name for these things. And that it would be done. So Lord, help us to pray. In Jesus' name.